Back for more, are you? Hello, Nick here, and we are continuing reading the timeless uh, fantasy novel by Peter S. Beagle, The Last Unicorn. Loved that uh, movie when it came out in the 80s when I was growing up, and we've been enjoying hearing uh, the full story, word for word, from, from the great author Peter S. Beagle. Please support him if you don't already have a copy. Let us continue with Chapter 5, shall we? And remember, Smendrick just got uh, abducted by Jack Jingley, being taken off into the woods uh, where he was originally under the, the sort of protection of uh, the mayor of a local town. And the unicorn ha has pursued uh, Smendrick and Jack Jingley into the forest. And now we're going to find out what happens next. All that Smendrick remembered later of this wild ride with the outlaws was the wind, the saddle's edge, and the laughter the jingling giant. He was too busy brooding over the ending of his hat trick to notice much else. Too much English, he suggested to himself, overcompensation. But he shook his head, which was difficult in his position. The magic knows what it wants to do, he thought, bouncing as the horse dashed across a creek. But I never know what it knows. Not at the right time, anyways. I'd write it a letter if I knew where it lived. Brush and branches raked his face, and owls hooted in his ears. The horses had slowed to a trot, then to a walk. An, a high, trembling voice called out, Halt and give the password. Damn me, here we go, Jack Jingley muttered. He scratched his head like the sound of sawing, with a sound like sawing, raised his voice and answered, A short life and a merry one, here in the sweet greenwood. Jolly comrades united to victory plighted. Liberty, the thin voice corrected, to liberty plighted. The L makes all the difference. Thank ye, to liberty plighted. Comrades united, nah, nah, I said that. A short life and a merry one. Jolly comrades, no, that's not it. Jack Jingley scratched his head again and groaned. Uh, to liberty plighted. Give me a little help, will you? All for one and one for all, the voice said obligingly. Can you get the rest yourself? All for one and one for all. I have it, the giant shouted. All for one and one for all. United we stand. Divided we fall. He kicked his horse and started on again. An arrow squealed out of the dark, sliced a wedge from his ear, nicked the horse of the man riding behind him, and skittered away like a bat. The outlaw scattered to the safety of the trees, and Jack Jingley yelled with rage, Damn your eyes! I gave the password ten times over! Let me only get my hands on ye! We changed the password while you were gone, Jack, came the voice of the sentry. It was too hard to remember. Ah, you changed the password, did ye? Jack Jingley dabbed at his bleeding ear with a fold of Smendrick's cloak. And how was I to know that, you brainless, tripeless, liverless get? Don't get mad, Jack, the sentry answered soothingly. You see, it doesn't matter if you don't know the new password because it's so simple. You just call like a giraffe. The captain thought of it himself. Call like a giraffe. The giant swore till even the horses fidgeted with embarrassment. You ninny, a giraffe makes no sound at all. The captain might as well have us call like a fish or a butterfly. I know. That way nobody can forget the password, even you. Isn't the captain clever? There's no limit to the man, Jack Jingley said wonderingly. But see here, who's to keep a ranger or one of the king's men from calling like a giraffe when you hail him? Aha, the sentry chuckled. That's where the cle that's where the cleverness of it is. You have to give the call three times. Two long and one short. Jack Jingley sat silent on his horse, rubbing his ear. Two long and one short, he sighed presently. Ah, well, tis no more foolish than the time he'd have no password at all and shot any who answered the challenge. Too long and one short, right. He rode on through the trees, and his men trailed after him. Would anybody like to, uh, to attempt a giraffe call? If you're watching this with somebody, why don't you go ahead and give your best uh, recollection of a giraffe call? I'm sure we could look it up, right? YouTube it. Voices murmured, murmured somewhere ahead. 
Sullen as robbed bees. As they drew nearer, Smendrick thought he could make out a woman's tone among them. Then, he f then his cheek felt firelight, and he looked up. They had halted in a small clearing where another ten or twelve men sat around a campfire, fretting and grumbling. The air smelled of burned beans. A freckled, red-haired woman, dressed in somewhat richer rags than the rest, strode forward to greet them. "'Well, Jack!' "'Oh, wait. Well, Jack!' he cried. "'Who is—' "'Oh, oh wait, sorry. Uh, "'Red-haired man—' "'Well, Jack!' he cried. "'Who is it you bring us, comrade or captive?' Over his shoulder he called to someone, "'Add some more water to the soup, love. There's company.' "'I don't know what he is myself,' Jack Jingly rumbled. He began to tell the story of the mare and the hat, but he had hardly reached the roaring descent upon the town when he was interrupted by a thin thorn of a woman who came pushing up through the ring of men to shrill, "'I'll not have it! Cully, the soup's no thicker than sweat as it is!' She had a pale, bony face with fierce, tawny eyes and hair the color of dead grass. "'And who's this long lout?' she asked, inspecting Smendrick as though he were something she had found sticking to the sole of her shoe. "'He's no townsman. I don't like the look of him. Slit his wizard.' She me had meant to say weasand or gizzard, and had said both, but the coincidence trailed down Smendrick's spine like wet seaweed. He's, that's a great metaphor. He slid off Jack Jingley's horse and stood before the outlaw captain. "'I am Smendrick, the magician,' he announced, swirling his cloak with both hands until it billowed feebly. "'And are you truly the famous Captain Cully of the Greenwood, boldest of the bold and freest of the free?' A few of the outlaws snickered, and the woman groaned. "'I knew it,' she declared. "'Got him, Cully, from gills to guilt, before he does you the way the last one did.' But the captain bowed, proudly, showing an eddy of baldness on his crown, and answered, "'That am I. He who hunts me for my head shall find a fearsome foe. But he who seeks me as a friend may find me friend now. How do you come here, sir?' "'On my stomach,' said Smendrick, "'and unintentionally, but in friendship nonetheless. Though your, though your lemon doubts it,' he added, nodding at the thin woman. She spat on the ground." Captain Cully grinned and laid his arms warily along the woman's sharp shoulders. "'Oh, that's only Molly Grew's way,' he explained. "'She guards me better than I do myself. "'I'm generous and easy, to the point of extravagance, perhaps. "'An open hand to all fugitives from tyranny, that's my motto. "'It's only natural that Molly should become suspicious, pinched, dour, "'prematurely old, even a touch tyrannical.' The bright balloon needs the knot at one end, eh, Molly? But she's a good heart, a good heart. The woman shrugged herself away from him, but the captain did not turn his head. You're welcome here, sir, sorcerer, he told Smendrick. Come to the fire and tell us your tale. How do they speak of me in your country? What have you heard of dashing Captain Cully and his band of free men? Have a taco. So they actually say that here in the book. If you ever watch the movie, uh, my sister called that, this out to me one time. She's like, there's a part where they sit down in the scene and he offers him a taco. Like, what? Uh, that's what you might call an anachronism, something that seems completely out of time or the, the scene, you know, the, the age that you're in. I don't know. It was the late 60s when this book was written, so there's all sorts of little Easter eggs and modern uh, references, even like the balloon. Did they have balloons truly back in what seems to be medieval fantasy times? No, but they didn't have unicorns either, so I guess we'll hand it to them. Have a taco. Smendrick accepted the place by the fire, graciously declined the gelid, mor the gelid morsel, and replied, I've heard you are the friend of the helpless and the enemy of the mighty and that you and your merry men lead a joyous life in the forest, stealing from the rich and giving to the poor. I know the tale of how you and Jack Jingley cracked one another's crowns with quarter staves and became blood brothers thereby, and how you saved your Molly from marriage to the rich old man her father had chosen for her. In fact, Smendrick had, heard, had never heard of Captain Cully before that very evening, but he had a good grounding in Anglo-Saxon folklore and knew the type. And of course, he hazarded, there was a certain wicked K 
king. Haggard! Rot and ruin him! Cully cried. Wait, Haggard! Rot and ruin him! Cully cried. Aye, there's not one here who, but's been done wrong by old King Haggard, given from, driven from his rightful land, robbed of his rank and rents, skinned out of his patrimony. They live only for revenge, mark you, magician, and on one day Haggard will pay such a reckoning. A score of shaggy shadows hissed assent, but Molly Grew's laughter fell like hail, rattling and stinging. Mayhap he will, she mocked, but it won't be to such chattering cravens he'll pay it. His castle rots and totters more each day, and his men are too old to stand up in armor. But he'll rule forever, for all Captain Cully dares. Smendrick raised an eyebrow, and Cully flushed radish red. "'You must understand,' he mumbled. "'King Haggard has this bull.' "'Ah, the Red Bull, the Red Bull,' Molly hooted. "'I tell you what, Cully, after all these years in the wood with you, "'I'll come to think the bull's not but the pet name you give your cowardice. "'If I hear that fable once more, I'll go down, old, I'll go and down old Haggard myself.' "'And know you for a—' "'Enough!' Cully roared. "'Not before strangers!' He tugged at his sword, and Molly opened her arms to it, still laughing. She's basically saying, "'Go ahead, stab me,' you know? Around the fire, greasy hands twittered dagger hilts, and longbows seemed to string themselves. But Smendrick spoke up, seeing, seeking to salvage Cully's sinking vanity. He hated family scenes. "'They sing a ballad of you in my country,' he began." I just forget how it goes. Captain Cully spun like a cat, ambushing his own tail. Which one? he demanded. I don't know, Smendrick answered, taken aback. Are there more than one? I indeed, Cully cried, glowing and growing as though pregnant with his pride. Willie Gentle, Willie Gentle, where is the lad? A lank-haired youth with a lute and pimple shambled up. Sing one of my exploits for the gentleman. Captain Cully ordered him. Sing the one about how you joined my band. I've not heard it since Tuesday last. The minstrel sighed, struck a chord, and began to sing in a wobbly countertenor. Oh, it was Captain Cully came riding home from slaying of the king's gay deer. When whom should he spy but a pale young man came drooping o'er the lee. What news, what news, my pretty young man? What ails ye that ye sigh so deep? Is it for the loss of your lady fair, or are ye but scabbit of your grief? I am a scrabbit, whatever that means, and my geep is as well as a geep may be. But I do sigh for my lady fair, whom my three brothers have riven from me. I'm Captain Cully of the sweet green wood, and the men at my call are fierce and free. If I do rescue your lady fair, what service will ye render me? If ye do rescue my lady fair, I will break your nose, ye you silly old gawk. But she wore an emerald at her throat, which my three brothers also took. <laughs> then the captain has gone to the three bold thieves, and he's made his sword bathe to shiver and sing. Ye may keep the last, but I'll hide the stone, for it's fit for the crown of a royal king. Now comes the best part, Cully whispered to Smendrick, who was bouncing eagerly on his toes, hugging himself. Then it's three cloaks off, and it's three swords out, and it's three swords whistling like the tea. By the faith of my body, says Captain Cully, now ye shall have neither the stain nor she. And he's driven them up, and he's driven them down, and he's driven them to and fro like sheep. Like sheep, Cully breathed, and rocked and hummed and parried three swords with his forearm for the remaining seventeen stanzas of the song, rapturously oblivious to Molly's mockery and the restlessness of his men. 
The ballad ended at last, and Smendrick applauded loudly and earnestly, complimenting Gentle Willie on his right-hand technique. "'I call it Alan Adale picking,' the minstrel answered. He would have expounded further, but Cully interrupted him, saying, "'Good Willie, good boy. Now play the others.' He beamed at what Smendrick hoped was an expression of pleased surprise. "'I said that there were several songs about me. There are thirty-one, to be exact.' "'Though none are in the child collection just, as pre just at present.' "'His eyes widened suddenly, and he, gasped the magician sh and he grasped the magician's shoulders. "'You wouldn't be Mr. Child himself, now would you?' he demanded. "'He often goes seeking ballads, ballads, so I've heard, disguised as a plain man.' "'Smendrick shook his head. "'No, I'm very sorry, really.' "'The captain sighed and released him. "'It doesn't matter,' he mummered, mum mummered, murmured. One always hopes, of course, even now, to be collected, to be verified, annotated, to have vibrant versions, even to have one's authenticity doubted. Well, well, never mind. Sing the other songs, Willie lad. You'll need the practice one day when your field recorded. The outlaws grumbled and scuffed, kicking at stones. A hoarse voice bawled from a safe shadow, "'Nah, Willie, sing us a true song. "'Sing us one about Robin Hood.' "'Who said that?' Cully's loosened, his, "'Cully's loosened sword clackled in its sheath "'as he turned from side to side. "'His face suddenly seemed as pale and weary "'as a used lemon drop. "'I did,' said Molly Grew, who hadn't. "'The men are bored with, your, with ballads of your bravery, Captain Darling, "'even if you did write them all yourself.' Cully winced and stole a side glance at Smendrick. "'They can still be folk songs, can't they, Mr. Child?' he asked in a low, worried voice. "'After all—' "'I'm not Mr. Child,' Smendrick said. "'Really, I'm not.' "'I mean, you can't leave epic events to the people. They get everything wrong.' An aging rogue in tattered velvet now slunk forward. "'Captain, if we're to have folk songs, I suppose we must.' Then we feel they ought to be true songs about real outlaws, not this lying life we live. No offense, Captain, but we're not really very. We're, but we're really not very merry when all said. I'm merry twenty-four hours a day, Dick Fancy. Cully said coldly. That is a fact. And we don't steal from the rich and give to the poor. Dick Fancy hurried on. We steal from the poor because they can't fight back. Most of them. And the rich take from us because they could wipe us out in a day. We don't rob the fat, greedy mare on the highway. We pay him tribute every month to leave us alone. We never carry off proud bishops and keep them prisoner in the woods, feasting and entertaining them, because Molly hasn't any good dishes. And besides, we just wouldn't be very stimulating company for a bishop. When we go to the fair in disguise, we never win at archery or at single stick. We do get some nice compliments on our disguises, but no more than that. I think that's just a hilarious. I just like the sort of almost tongue-in-cheek, somewhat satire-ish uh, sort of uh, take on the fantasy genre here. I sent a tapestry to the judging ones, Molly remembered. It came in fourth, a fifth, a night at vigil. Everybody was doing vigils that year. Suddenly she was scrubbing her eyes with horny knuckles. Damn you, Cully. What? What? he yelled in exasperation. Is it my fault you didn't keep up with your weaving? Once you had your man, you let all your accomplishments go. You don't sew or sing anymore. You haven't illustrated a manuscript in years. What happened to that voila de gamba I got you? He turned to Smendrick. We might, we might as well be married the way she's gone to seed. The magician nodded fractionally and looked away. And for the right wronging, and for righting wrongs and fighting for civil liberties, that sort of thing, Dick Fancy said, it wouldn't be so bad. I mean, I'm not the crusader type myself. Some are and some aren't. But then we have to sing these songs about wearing Lincoln green and aiding the oppressed. We don't, Cully. We turn them in for reward. And those songs are just embarrassing, that's all, and there's the truth of it. Captain Cully folded his arms, ignoring the outlaw's snarls of agreement. Sing the songs, Willie. I'll not, the minstrel would not raise a hand to touch his lute. And you never fought my brothers for any stone, Cully. 
You wrote them a letter, which you didn't sign. Cully drew back his arm, and blades blinked among the men as though someone had blown on a heap of coals. At this point, Smendrick stepped forward again, smiling urgently. If I may offer an alternative, he suggested, why not let your guest earn his night's lodging by amusing you? I can neither sing nor play, but I have my own accomplishments, and you may not have seen their like. Jack Jingley agreed, immediately saying, Aye, Cully, a magician. T'would be a rare treat for the lads. Molly Grew grumbled some savage generalization about wizards as a class, but the men shouted with quick delight, throwing one another into the air. The only real reluctance was shown by Captain Cully himself, who protested sadly, Yes, but the songs. Mr. Child must hear the songs. And so I will, Smendrick assured him. A later. <clears throat> Excuse me. Cully brightened then and cried to his men to give away to give way and make room. They sprawled and squatted in the shadows, watching with sprung grins as Smendrick began to run through the old flummeries with which he had entertained the country folk at the midnight carnival. It was paltry magic, but he thought it diverting enough for such a crew as Cully's. But he had judged them too easily. They applauded his rings and scarves his ears full of goldfish and aces, with a proper politeness, but without wonder. Offering no true magic, he drew no magic back from them. And when a spell failed, as when promising to turn a duck into a duke for them to rob, he produced a handful of duke cherries. He was clapped just as kindly and vacantly as though he had succeeded. They were a perfect audience. Cully smiled impatiently, and Jack Jingley dozed. But it startled the magician to see the disappointment in Molly Grew's restless eyes. Sudden anger made him laugh. He dropped seven spinning balls that had been glowing brighter and brighter as he juggled them. On a good evening, he could make them catch fire. Let go all his hated skills and closed his eyes. Matt, do as you will, he whispered to the magic. Do as you will. It sighed through him, beginning somewhere secret, in his shoulder blade, perhaps, or in the marrow of his shin bone. His heart filled and tautened like a sail, and something moved more surely in his body than he ever had. It spoke with his voice, commanding. Weak with power, he sank to his knees and waited to be Smendrick again. I wonder what I did. I did something. He opened his eyes. Most of the outlaws were chuckling and tapping their temples, glad of the chance to mock him. Captain Cully had risen, anxious to pronounce that part of the entertainment ended. Then Molly Grew cried out in a soft, shaking voice, Oh! and all turned to see what she saw. A man came walking into the clearing. He was dressed in green, but for a brown jerkin and a slanting brown cap, with a woodcock's feather in it. He was very tall, too tall for a living man. The great bow slung over his shoulder looked as long as Jack Jingley, and his arrows could have made spears or staves for Captain Cully. Taking no notice of all, taking no notice at all of the still, shabby forms by the fire, he strode through the light and vanished with no sound of breath or footfall. After him, came others, one at a time, or two together, some conversing, many laughing, but none making any sound. All carried long bows, and all wore green, save one who came clad in scarlet to his toes, and another gowned in a friar's brown habit, his feet in sandals, and his enormous belly contained by a rope belt. One played a lute and sang silently as he walked. Alan Adele, it was raw, willy gentle. Look at those changes. His voice was as naked as a baby bird. Effortless, effortlessly proud, graceful as giraffes, even the tallest among them, a kind-eyed blunderbore, the bowman moved across the clearing. Last, hand in hand, came a man and a woman. Their faces were as beautiful as though they had never known fear. Wow, what a line. Their faces were as beautiful as though they had never known fear. 
The woman's heavy hair shone with a secret, like a cloud that hides the moon. Oh, said Molly Grew, Marion. Robin Hood is a myth, Captain Cully said nervously. A classic example of the heroic folk figures synthesized out of need. John Henry is another. Men have to have heroes, but no man can ever be as big as the need, so the legend grows around a grain of truth, like a pearl. Not that this isn't a remarkable trick, of course. It was the seedy, dandy Dick Fancy who moved first. All the figures, but the last two had passed into the darkness when he rushed after them, calling hoarsely, Robin! Robin! Mr. Hood, sir! Wait for me! Neither the man nor the woman turned, but every man of Cully's band, saving only Jack Jingley and the captain himself, ran to the clearing's edge, tripping and trampling one another, kicking the fire so that the clearing churned with shadows. Robin, they shouted, Marion, Scarlet, Little John, come back, come back. Smendrick began to laugh tenderly and helplessly. Over their voices, Captain Cully screamed, Fools, fools and children! It was a lie, like all magic. There is no such person as Robin Hood. But the outlaws, wild with loss, went crashing into the woods after the shining archers, stumbling over logs, falling through thorn bushes, wailing hungrily as they ran. Only Molly Grew stopped and looked back. Her face was burning white. Nay, Cully, you have it backward, she called to him. There's no such person as you, or me, or any of us. Robin and Marion are real, and we are the legend. She ran on crying, wait, wait, like the others, leaving Captain Cully and Jack Jingley to stand in the trampled firelight and listen to the magician's laughter. Smendrick hardly noticed when they sprang on him, seized his arms, nor did he flinch when Cully pricked his ribs with a dagger hissing, that was a dangerous diversion, Mr. Child, and rude as well. You could have said you didn't want to hear the songs. The dagger twitched deeper. Far away, he heard Jack Jingley growl, He's not child, Kelly, nor is he any journeyman wizard, neither. I know him now. He's Haggard's son, the Prince Lear, as foul as his father and doubtlessly handy with the black arts. Hold your hand, Captain. He's no good to us dead. Cully's voice dropped low. Are you sure, Jack? He seems such a pleasant fellow. Pleasant fool, you mean. Aye, Lear has that air. I've heard tell. He plays the gormless innocent, but he's the devil for deception. The way he gave out to be this child cove, just to get you off your guard. I wasn't off my guard, Jack, Cully protested. Not for a moment. I may have seemed to be, but I'm very deceptive myself. And the way he called up Robin Hood to fill the lads with longing to turn them against you. Aye, but he gave himself away that time, and now he'll bide with us, though his father sent the Red Bull to free him. Cully caught his breath at that, but the giant snatched up the unresisting magician for the second time that night and bore him to a great tree, where he bound him with his face to the trunk, and his arms stretched around it. Smendrick giggled gently all through the operation, and made matters easier by hugging the tree as fondly as a new bride. There, Jack Jingley said at last, do you guard him do you guard him the night, Cully, whiles I sleep, and in the mornings it's me to old Haggard to see what's his boy worth to him? Happen we'll all be gentlemen of leisure in a month's time. What of the men? Cully asked worriedly. Will they come back, do you think? The giant yawned and turned away. Oh, I'll be back by morning, sad and sneezing, and you'll have to be easy with them for a bit. They'll be back, for them not the sort to trade something for nothing. And no more am I. Robin Hood might have stayed for, might have stayed for us if we were. Good night to you, Captain. There was no sound when he was gone but crickets, and Smendrick's soft chuckling to the tree. The fire faded, and Cully turned in circles, sighing as each ember went out. Finally, he sat down on a stump and addressed the captive magician. Haggard's son you may be, he mused, and not the collector child, as you claim. <laughs> Didn't claim that, but whatever. 
But whoever you are, you know very well that Robin Hood is the fable and I am the reality. No ballads will accumulate around my name unless I write them myself. No children will read of my adventures in their school books and play at being me after school. And when the professors prowl through the old tales and scholars sift the old songs to learn if Robin Hood ever truly lived, they will never, never find my name. Not till they crack the world for the grain of its heart. You know, but you know, and therefore I am going to sing you the songs of Captain Cully. He was a good, gay rascal who strode from, stole from the rich and gave to the poor. In their gratitude, the people made up these simple verses about him. Whereupon he sang them all, including the one that Willie Gentle had sung for Smendrick. He paused often to comment on the varying rhythm patterns, the, a, uh, the, as, uh, the azenanal rhymes, and the modal melodies. So that must have been a delightful uh, evening for Smendrick to spend, hearing all those self-aggrandizing songs from Captain Cully. And my alert went off almost right on time here. That is the end of Chapter 5. So we're making our way here. Hope you enjoy it. would love to hear your comments. If you've seen the, the last Unicorn movie from the 80s, and uh, I think it was the 80s. It might have been the 70s, actually, even. No, I think it was the 70s, uh, if Wikipedia serves, my memory serves. But let me know if you have how you think this story, the read-along, is comparing to the movie. Any feedback about the voices I'm doing? Uh, I've been kind of using the movie as a bit of a benchmark or a guideline, as a default here. But, um, yeah, we always welcome your feedback. Thanks for reading with me. We'll see you on the next one. <laughs>